Hi, everyone, and welcome to Global Impact, the podcast and vodcast that connects the dots so you don't have to. I am your co host, Melissa Ricci, and I'm your other co host, Michael Basikiu. Hi, Melissa. Hi, hello. How are you? I'm very good. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's been so long. I think it's been a month and a half, right? We took a long, yeah. long break. Right? We had a long break, but then we thought we'd use that time to, uh, you know, marshal our forces and uh, look at who's out there in this uh, big world of ours. Interesting to talk to. And I, I thought it was a great idea we came up with to start the new year off with a bang with a really cool episode. Yes. And uh, yeah, we have amazing like guests lined up for this new year. So it's going to be very, very exciting and lots of changes. We're going to implement them like as we go. So that's going to be exciting. It's going to be a little bit different. Uh, So stay tuned because uh, we're going to have excited things going on. Um, But aside from this, it's raining in LA. Uh, How is the weather? We've had a lot of rain here uh, in British Columbia and the Pacific Northwest to the extent that um, you know, we had a lot of snow, which is very unusual. And then also the, the ground is so saturated that some of these magnificent trees that we have here in this part of the world actually falling over. It's quite sad. So uh, yeah, yeah, many changes by man and by mother nature as well. Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yes, we don't have much catastrophe here. I mean, we just had a tsunami uh, alert. Um, so did we. Yeah, like two, I think two days ago. And yeah. I was in the wrong, I was in Huntington Beach. So, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I was like, okay, never happened before. I was a little bit, woo, something's happening. But here we go, here we are alive. And um, let's just jump in into introducing our special guest. Would you like to start, Michael? Sure. Mm-hmm. So we're extremely honored and pleased to have uh, a friend of mine who I met, um, on a panel uh, last year, a frontline online panel, Janine Di Giovanni. She was um, a war reporter for three decades, uh, multi-award winner, journalist and writer, winner of the 2019 Guggenheim Fellowship. And in 2020, she was uh, awarded the Blake Dodd Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters for Lifetime Achievement in Nonfiction. Uh, many of her books, of course, are nonfiction dealing with her career and her life as a war correspondent. She's also a senior fellow at Yale University, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, and is the former Edward R. Murrell Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Janine has written and reported from the Balkans, Africa, and the Middle East, where she witnessed the siege of Sarajevo, uh, the fall of Grozny, and genocides in Srebrenica and Rwanda in 1994, as well as more than a dozen uh, active conflicts. Yeah, well, she's also uh, a best-selling author and of many books depicting mostly her personal journey uh, and research as a war correspondent in the most unstable, dangerous, uh, frightening places on the map. Um, And um, actually, as Alif Shafak from the Financial Times said, and I quote, um, it is crucial to reveal the human stories behind the news. Janine Di Giovanni does this with heartbreaking eloquence. So today we are going to focus on her latest book. Uh, The title is The Vanishing, Faith, Loss, and the Twilight of Christianity in the Land of Prophets. Uh, Published, uh, it's published by the, yeah, that's the one, I've got it too. <laughs> it's published by uh, Public Affair Books. It chronicles um, in exquisitely written narrative. It's it's beautifully written. Uh, the stunning decline um, in the numbers of Christians in the Middle East. Um, in recent times, you know, with the pandemic and the hardship of the pandemic and 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 the division among humanity, which is astonishing. Uh, more than ever, we need today hope. And, um, and a sense of togetherness. And um, what a better way to, to, have, to start this new year and to have a discussion about, uh, about hope, faith, and the danger also that Christian minorities are facing in the Middle East. So that's going to be a very exciting episode. And um, we hope that whoever is watching right now is going to 
get back in touch with whichever faith they have, because it's not just about being a Christian, it's about just believing and hope. And uh, we just want to make sure that this is just for everybody. And, uh, and Jainin is here with us right now. So let's dig in. <laughs> so thank you so much for uh, your time and also for sending us copies of your book, uh, The Vanishing, which uh, we both read <laughs> very carefully. Uh, I read it in uh, buses and trains and airplanes and that got me through these long periods of travel, but uh, it really took me back as well to the times I spent in the Middle East and East Jerusalem, the West Bank, Gaza, Cairo, places like that. Um, and I, I think we, Melissa and I both agree that it was such a heartfelt, touching read. And at the, at the same time, for many people, a lesson in history and in faith. Um, and then we also noted that through your writing, you share uh, emotional, personal stories uh, with extremely unusual circumstances, war zones and conflicts and still manage to write with, with such eloquence. We'll get into the book a little bit in, in a few minutes, but uh, uh, thank God you're safe and you made it back to New York and to, to be able to write this book. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure sure. to be here. Well, yeah, and I just wanted to add that me being French, I mean, particularly the first, um, you know, the introduction was very vivid for me and you threw me back into Paris but I haven't been back for two years, you know, like I miss my family and yeah. um, that I was tearing up, you know, I mean, the first chapters were very heartbreaking for me because you described what my family was going through and uh, it was very vivid and very um, relatable, very relatable. And um, so, and the, 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 the writing is exquisite, by the way, um, it's very beautifully written. So I definitely recommend the book and I'm going to again. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. We will post the links, um, you know, your website, the links, every, you know, I already got people asking me where they could get the book and we haven't even started the episode. So here we oh, go. Thank <laughs> you so much. I'm, I'm very grateful. Um, so it really, what's interesting is that I, the way it was written was not how it was meant to be written. I, I've been working in the Middle East for many years, 30 years, which it dates me, but, um, and I'd been focused solely on this book for about five years of research. So going back and forth to Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, um, with these communities and doing you know, a really deep dive into it. And then when the time came, when I felt like, okay, now I have enough research, I'm gonna sit down with my notebooks and write, COVID hit. And it, I was in France because I was dropping my son off for spring break. I, I thought I would get back on the plane two days later, see yeah. some friends. And instead, I was there for six months um, in this very remote, first in Paris, and then in this very remote village in the Alps where um, my ex-husband's family have lived for 400 years. And we were with some of my French cousins who are extremely devout Catholics, uh, very, very devout. Mm -hmm. So the book took on a very different tone. I really didn't set out to make it so personal. I thought it would be a kind of an academic book, a bit like my last book, which was about the war in Syria yeah. and much more straightforward reportage. But as it turned out, I think the pandemic threw all of us into a kind of, um, into a, a, a time where we questioned ourselves, our mortality, um, the fear, the level of fear that we felt. And it made me realize that in times of great insecurity and fear, hmm. people turn to faith if they have it. I, I have plenty of friends who said, I envy you because at that time, I, I don't have a personal faith or a belief in God. And I, I wish I did because it was such a difficult time. It, it still well, is, of course. No, it was, and it still is. And uh, I think what was interesting about the book also is that it just, anybody who's lost faith and hope somehow got a glimpse of, you know, this again and got a refresher and I, I think it's going to help a lot of people you know this episode and the book because we're going to be talking about faith we're going to be talking about the book we're going to be talking about um how you cope and everything all this is going to be there so um okay so let's dive into the book and so first of all the book is um so it's about how christian minorities in the middle east um are persecuted and in danger of vanishing altogether this is mainly what was the theme of the book. 
Um, Christianity obviously started with Jesus, right? And ironically, he's a Middle Eastern Jew, a brown yes. person. And, um, and at the same time, um, they were Arabs, you know, Christian back then were Arabs. They were not um, as white people, Christian think, you know, they were. So it's, it's kind of ironic, you know, that right now Jesus is painted as a white person. He was not. No. Yeah, Christianity was born in the Middle East. And the person who started it was a Middle Eastern. So why, um, why do you think um, they are persecuted today? And what, what do you think triggered the actual Christian exodus? Well, I think Christians have been persecuted for 2,000 years. But in the Middle East, and, and Melissa, you're so right. So many people don't realize that Jesus Christ was a Middle Eastern Jew, and he was indeed, he was a brown person. Um, you know, the depictions we have of, you know, the, the heavenly iconic images, well, this was the Middle East 2000 years ago. Um, these communities that I focused on, and I did not, to take the entire Middle East, I decided very specifically that I was going to focus on four communities who I felt were the most at risk, Gaza, Iraq, Syria, and Egypt. Many people say, why didn't you include Lebanon? Uh, very specifically because Lebanese Christians are much more assimilated and um, in the political system, the social system, the economic system. Yeah. They have plenty of challenges, but they aren't the same as the, the communities I focused on who really are in danger of uh, being wiped off their ancestral lands. Um, so I really wanted to paint a picture of people who are ancient. And the thing that's really striking is if you are in Northern Iraq and you go to a mass where they're speaking Aramaic, it's the language of Jesus Christ. It's an ancient language. Um, and they are speaking the language that Jesus spoke, that the prophets spoke. Um, and it's it's extraordinary to see them in their, their lands. And the fact that they are at grave risk of this modern day exodus where they could disappear entirely. Um, and that's really why I wrote it. I really wanted to make a document that would be a living testimony to them and their culture and their lifestyle. They're called the living stones. That's what they're, that's how they're depicted. And I think that's a very beautiful, but very tragic way of putting it, you know, the living stones. And that's what these descendants, and they are the descendants of the prophets, that is what they are today. Right. Yeah, it, it was very, uh, it's interesting, you, you know, because the, you met so many people and there's so many characters, uh, personalities in the book, you know, and uh, I was, um, I got attached to some of them. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you start, it's almost like you're thrown into the story, you know, it's also like a storytelling. And, um, and yes, and, and, and thinking that those people could disappear at any time, it's it's almost like an eloge, you know, like a sort of a, it's beautiful what you did, I think, um, to give them a voice, a story, and those people might, you know, disappear, but that will not. Very, very much the job of a journalist is to give a voice to the voiceless, which you have done. Um, Janine, in the book, uh, you documented very well how Christians had placed their trust in dictators and later manipulated and persecuted by the very people they trusted, forcing many of them to flee. Um, Bashar al-Assad, uh, Mubarak uh, in Egypt, uh, uh, Saddam Hussein. It seems to be a pattern, and I'm wondering if you had any thoughts on why that is. Why do they seem to end up kind of in the same way? Christian minorities have traditionally been protected by dictators. So, I mean, I think it's a very, it's very hard for us. We live in democracies, right? So it's, it, unless you can put yourself in their shoes of being a minority in a country where they feel they're extremely vulnerable and to give their voting block to a dictator, whether it's Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad, or Mubarak, they felt that they were in exchange getting some kind of protection. Um, now, there was never a, an official policy of this in any way, and it's something that, you know, it's very disputed if you speak to various political scientists in the region. It's something almost to deal with the devil. But having said that, I was in um, 
Iraq throughout the whole run up to uh, the fall of Saddam Hussein and the American invasion, the Allied invasion. Um, and I would go up to the north and go to the masses and, and meet with the communities. They were absolutely terrified at what would come next. It wasn't so much, I mean, Saddam was a monster and he persecuted the Kurds, as we know, he persecuted other minorities, but the Christian communities there, the Chaldeans, the Assyrians, um, the Greek Orthodox, they felt that their best bet was with him. And very similar in Syria, which of course is going into its 12th year of, wow. of brutal, brutal, brutal war. Um, if you're a Christian in Syria, um, again, the fear was that what could come after Bashar al-Assad. And I think um, many of the people that I spoke to during the war and in the time I was trying to get inside these communities, they were really afraid. So whether or not they genuinely in their heart felt, we love Bashar, we love Bashar, which is what they told me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was fear or if it was that they really genuinely felt he was a better bet than let's say al-Nusra. Yeah, the less um, evil basically, yeah. And the same with, with the Egyptians. Yeah. Um, Gaza was is a very different situation mm -hmm. um, and we could get more into that. But every, each of these communities, some they them, thematically, they have similar issues, which is that they're in danger of being eradicated, but each of them faces very different challenges. So, um, you know, Gaza had its own has its own separate set, which is the the siege by Israeli and, and Egyptian um, blockades, but equally Hamas. Um, so Gaza was probably the most closed community to work in. Very difficult to to get people to open up and to trust you. Yeah. Why don't we uh, jump ahead into to Gaza then? Because I did have a sp specific question there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you documented very well in your book how areas such as Gaza, there is kind of an overwhelming sense of hopelessness as well. And uh, I've spent a lot of time there uh, with UNICEF. And um, I wanted to put it to you this way with a small vignette, if I can. So I was in the northern part of the Gaza Strip in Rafa. Uh, interviewing teenage uh, kids there. And I specifically remember this uh, one teenage uh, girl. We interviewed her in her school in front of a Mickey Mouse mural. Yeah. But the mural was all shot up. And so was the school. And uh, we asked her uh, what she wanted to do when she grew up. And she said, well, I want to join the ranks of the fighters so that I can get even with the enemy. Um, and um, I think oftentimes it doesn't take much to draw such young people into extremist elements. And I'm wondering, Janine, confronted with something like that or presented with something like that, what would you say to these young people who all of their lives, they faced a life basically of, you well documented in the book of, from the day they're born of bombings and a very little hope of joblessness. Well, I've worked in Gaza the long 30 years. I mean, I started working there during the first intifada now I find myself interviewing the children and sometimes the grandchildren of, of the Shabab yeah. that I knew back in the early 90s. Um, and actually this week I have a big piece coming out in Vanity Fair, which is about the youth in Gaza. Great. So it's, it's interesting um, because I, you know, this is always the Israeli line. Well, they hate us and they're growing up with hate. Well, let me put it to you this way. If you grow up under a severe occupation, where you've had um, Israeli soldiers kicking down the door and dragging your father away in the middle of the night. If you're a child and you're asked to draw something and what you draw is war planes. If you live on a street where, let's say the May bombing, uh, the Israeli attack in May, where 267 people were killed, 67 of them children, they're certainly not Hamas fighters. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, Hamas is always used as the boogeyman in Gaza. And they're bad guys. I'm not in any way defending them. But the Israeli occupation was going on long before Hamas was elected in Gaza. The people of Gaza and the West Bank, what's going on in Sheikh, Sheikh Jarrah right now, have suffered enough. And, um, you know, it's an entirely different topic, 
but it's very clear where I stand on that. You know, I've worked there for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we want to um, have a generation that is going to be able to work towards peaceful settlements, then we need to treat them with dignity and respect mm -hmm. and stop the bloody occupation. But and even though there's no longer Israeli soldiers inside Gaza, mm -hmm. they're certainly there psychologically through the siege and, and, um, and the bombings which occur. So, that would be my answer. Yeah, and then the, the noise of the drones and are always present as well. You yeah. very well captured the contrasts of Gaza too, which I've seen as well, where on one side you can face the Mediterranean and you see this beautiful calm coastline and then you turn around and you see all the devastation. I think you said in the book, uh, I think it was maybe a UN agency that said that, I think by this year or by last year, Gaza should have imploded given yeah. the, the- 2021, yeah. Yeah, 2021. Yeah, it was it was a UN report. Um, basically, it was that it would be unlivable, and it's it's unlivable because of the lack yeah. of sanitation, the water conditions, climate change. Um, the Israeli, the last Israeli bombing basically destroyed a lot of farmland, mm -hmm. um, hydroponic farms, uh, the water situation. So, I mean, it is. I, they said that that report came out, I think, in twenty eleven, and they said by twenty twenty one, Gaza will be unlivable. Well, it's twenty twenty two, yeah, and. Um, you know, it is, I was there in August, it was the worst I've ever seen it. And I can remember standing in Gaza right after the Oslo Accords were signed and thinking, mm -hmm. you know, we could have some forward action towards peace and that has never come. So yeah. Gaza is a place um, people like to forget about. The Israelis say it's a bone stuck in their throat. They can't swallow it, they can't spit it out, but we can't ignore it. There's 2 yeah. million people there. Yeah. So but that this problem has been going on for almost like 2000 years. I mean, what I don't I mean, it's it's almost like it does feel to me that they don't want to sort out the problem, you know. They, it should have been so easy, right? To give yeah. them territory and it's kind of sad because the victims are always the children and the civilians, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But getting back to the Christians there, mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, there's 800 Christians in Gaza, which is tiny, tiny. Sure. Gaza had once been entirely Christian until the fourth century. Um, and they, what they suffer is the same as what the other 2 million Muslim and, and other people suffer. They all suffer the same thing. Electricity cuts. Yeah, because more. they're Arabs, Christians anyway. Yeah, yeah. so they, um, but they're, in, in a sense, I mean, they're also uh, prohibited from leaving to go join their families in Bethlehem mm -hmm. um, for Christmas, for Easter. So they have this restriction of movement and they also have unemployment is 80%. Um, and Gazans are highly, highly educated, highly educated. I think it's got the highest rate of um, education in the Middle East or one of them. I mean, they're brilliant young people, extraordinary yeah. with amazing potential. Um, and they, yet they can't leave to do yeah. job training, to do any entrepreneurship roles, to get, to go to university. I have many friends who have, um, who have appointments at prestigious universities, Harvard, Syracuse, they can't get visas. The Israelis won't let them out. Wow. So it's, um, it's really for Christians, especially to be this tiny little minority, 800 people dwindling I think there's a real sense of insecurity. Yeah. Well, okay, let's get out of Gaza. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have the answer. I know. It's it's a really frustrating and sad. It's sad frustrating and it's, yeah, I mean, just, I, you know, till we get the answers, I mean, the conversation is always going to be painful. And, yeah. Uh, so let's get back into faith, which is a, a better yeah. conversation. Yeah, definitely. And, yes. Um, yeah, so basically... So I wanted to talk about Christianity in general, um, because there's been studies that apparently Christianity is declining in the West also um, with the new generation, you know, like the millennials, um, you know, they, they're kind of losing faith and trust in the church because maybe of scandals, you know, the, the whole sexual abuses, yes. Yes. All these things that have been happening with the Vatican and, um, and less and less people are going to church. And, um, and so and it's also all this social media and people having their smartphone. I mean, you know, people are worshiping now. 
what is this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that Nothing. was God calling. <laughs> um that was that's exactly <laughs> i'm like whoa what are you talking what are you saying melissa <laughs> that was the timing um but what i'm trying to to, to get to before god interrupted me uh is that <laughs> what do you think that's happening why do you think people are losing faith in 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 the, in the church in christianity um i think you know, in France, there's a real problem with aging population and, and younger people aren't going to mass. I, you know, I myself, I have to say, I'm not, I don't go every Sunday, but I do go to church when I feel the need to. And often I just go in during the middle of the week or, or just stop in. And um, I think it's harder to, the, the rules that some of us were brought up in, I mean, I, I went to Catholic school nearly my entire life and it was a very strict um, Dominican education. And I think that we live in a time right now where I think people find it very hard to follow strict rules. And I think the church is evolving. I think um, Papa Francesco is extraordinary. Um, he, you know, I think he's trying to see a way to move into uh, the new millennium where we, you know, we have a completely different way of living and of mm -hmm. honoring our faith than we did in the time of Pope John Paul. Yeah. Um, you know, society has gone through massive changes and is continuing to, whether it's feminism, yeah. gay rights, Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. um, climate change, all these things have to be taken into account. And I do think, you know, the Vatican is a traditional establishment, um, but I do think he, as, as a, our spiritual leader, has been remarkable. And one thing that he's done, which I always point out, is he yeah. went to Iraq at the height of COVID. He's yeah. an elderly yeah. pope, he's yeah. frail, he has medical conditions. He was advised by everyone not to go. Uh, Iraq is largely unvaccinated, but he went at the height of COVID to a dangerous place and he said mass. And I think that sent one of the strongest messages of faith that you possibly could send, which is that we are all a community you are our brothers and sisters and you are not alone. So I thought that was really remarkable. And um, how do we get more people into church? I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, well, I mean, I feel, and you know, my mother would disagree with me on this. Um, I can go into an Orthodox church and pray and feel I'm with God. I can be in a field in Rwanda I can be in an open air church. I can go to a Lutheran church. I can go to a Presbyterian church, a church of England. Mm -hmm. To me, God is God. Yes. I can go to a Jewish temple. Yeah, you um, or, that in the book, you mentioned this, that it didn't matter where, which church, which segregation or anything, you just, for you, it was just a matter of connecting and being together. You yeah, know? and faith. It's a matter of faith, a belief in something yeah. stronger than you, bigger yeah. than you. Bigger. Um, I have, you know, most of my friends are atheists or agnostic and they say to me and they, you know, and we're intellectuals, right? So science tried to prove God and an existence and an afterlife. Even um, I was talking to someone last night about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who of course the great authority on death. And she used to say that no one dies alone, that mm -hmm. when you pass, there is always someone who is guiding you sure. to the other side. Yeah. And a friend of mine said, but what if you don't believe in the other side? <laughs> what if you believe that like animals, you know, we die and that's it. That's we, are, we are stardust, you know, we go into the... So I think faith is something you have or you do not. And I don't, you know, I'm not evangelical, so I don't know how to, if someone doesn't believe, I'm not the person that's going to say, become a believer. Mm -hmm. I just know that I do. And I just know what it means in my life and what I was trying to document in this book, what it means to these people that have been so extraordinarily um, persecuted and discriminated against, but yet they still believe and they still go to church and they still stay in places where radical groups like the Islamic State want to destroy them and we have to add also the fact that being a christian in the middle east is nowhere near being a christian in the west because that yeah. could cost you your life 
it's not yeah. a choice it's it's just a blind belief and and the sacrifice they're making for what they believe is unbelievable in here it's almost like well you know i want to be a buddhist i want to be you have yeah. a choice to free yeah. the or buddhist. spirituality and yeah right. it, yeah I, you know, one of the most touching things for me um, was in northern Iraq or Syria, these young men um, who have tattoos of crosses, you know, the crucifixes, um, and they, you know, they had grown up their entire lives as a minority in, in, in a country where they were, they were persecuted, where they were insecure, where they were vulnerable, and yet, you know, their tattoos were of Jesus or of a, a crucifix. Mm -hmm. And I think we often forget, and it's very easy, again, we live in democracies, places where you could go to mass, mm -hmm. you can worship what, what you want to, you can say what you want to, but to really grow up during authoritarian rule mm -hmm. um, in a liberal democracies or places where there is not, absolutely not democracy, where it's dictatorship, the courage that it takes to, to believe your religious convictions. So these people are really, really extraordinary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, reading your book, it struck me, Janine, that during your most difficult times, you um, seem to turn to prayer or uh, find protection and solace in a house of worship. Um, and that really seemed to give you a lot of strength to carry on. Um, I think it's fair to say now, uh, especially in the West, that many people's faith is being tested. We're now going, what, into the third year of COVID. Yeah. Our climate seems to be <laughs> deteriorating on us right in front of our faces. And um, I've talked to a lot of people, I'm sure you have as well, that they just find it so difficult to, I guess, put their trust in a higher being right now because it doesn't seem like sometimes that higher being is really looking after us or our young or our old, especially are being stolen away from us before their time has come. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think right now, I think this is probably the worst in, in a sense. It's not the most dangerous time of the pandemic because I think 2020 was really yeah. scary before we had the vaccine. I think personally, I think we're coming out of it. Um, this is the last wave, I hope, but um, I think that people are exhausted and I think they're morally um, compromise. I think that we've had to witness things that we didn't want to see. Mainly, I mean, for me, what this pandemic has shown is the vast economic disparity in, in America, the terrible healthcare system. Um, and, and also the, it's, it's, it's illuminated political divides, which I think are um, very unfortunate about the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. And, um, so I think that right now, I mean, in America anyway, there is this terrible state of division. Um, and I probably, like to me now more than ever is the time when you need faith because you're really at, we're really at the bottom. We need to kind of, and it's January, <laughs> which yeah. doesn't help. So we need, to, we need to see some sort of light, some sort of hope. Um, it's, it's a bit, disappointing president biden a year ago this week was you know inaugurated and i think all of us had this very wary hope oh thank god the trump years are over um we're, we've got a vaccine coming um we're gonna have the democrats back in power and you know we're reassessing now it's been a disappointing year i personally don't think it was him <laughs> you know i think he 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 inherited a yeah. massive set of problems including um you know, Russia, COVID, climate change, um, many issues, and a, a faulty healthcare system. So your question about getting back to faith, um, you know, I think people probably did find themselves coming back to whatever their faith is or whatever their moral core is. Um, mm -hmm. I write a lot about something called... Um, um, moral are, are more like what we believe in in moral injury and i think that we have been injured moral injury is essentially a scar on the soul and i think we have been as society we have been deeply traumatized by what's mm. happened i really do and i think it's going to take a long time for us to come back together as as communities yeah 
Speaking of that, do you have any thoughts, Janine, on some of the permanent changes which may take hold because of the pandemic? I'm thinking, for example, how we even possibly relate to each other. It's so contrary in a way that the pandemic has forced us to stay away from people who are such yeah. social beings and people deliberately Isolate. avoid you, for example. Yeah. I mean, I've just, you know, I'm flying next week. And so I've just decided I don't want to see anyone this week. Um, and mm. I just thought how odd it is yeah. to say to people, well, I'm, I, I want to get on a plane and I want to test negative. So I'm going to isolate myself with my son and hope he doesn't pick it up at school mm -hmm. uh, or, or else, you know, I take care of a very old mother and um, I don't want to pass it on to her. So mm -hmm. we're living, I, I, I did go to a dinner last night. And actually while I was there, when I left, someone reached to hug me. I'm a very tactile person <laughs> and I felt myself stiffen. And I thought, you know, I wonder how long it's going to take us to go back to life where we don't, you know, yeah, yeah. the elbow, um, or where we trust people again. Because the fact is we're set up now to think the person next to you on the subway is gonna cough and give you mm -hmm. something which could potentially kill you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. or kill someone else. Kill or kill someone, someone else. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we're all vaccinated. Hopefully we're all um, careful people, but you might be in a situation where you're with someone who's not, and I think, that kind of trust we have to regain as a society. But look, we're living in dark times, definitely. But society, humanity has gone through darker times before and come out of it. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe, and again, this is my faith-based optimism, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, human beings are the most resilient creatures and we, we are able to bounce back from things better and wiser and stronger. And hopefully we will have lessons learned from this, which is um, on, a, on an individual scale, things like honesty and helping mm -hmm. other people, protecting the most vulnerable, but on a larger scale, climate change, our healthcare systems, pandemics, um, taking care of poorer nations, making sure they get vaccines. And again, you know, all of these, if we're gonna get back to faith in the book um, is about what I was raised with Christian values, but I think that they're not just Christian values, they're, they're Judaic, they're Islamic. I mean, mm -hmm. every Buddhist, um, every faith basically at its core has love. Yeah. And love is what I feel has allowed these ancient people that I write about to survive for so long because so many armies tried to crush them. There were so many plagues, there were so many, mm -hmm various crusades or wars or insurrections and or who better than yourself to actually because you witnessed so much i mean three decades of yeah. war you were war correspondents in so many places you've seen the on i can't even imagine what you've seen i there's chapters i mean there's actually in the book something i wanted to to read because that was crazy I, you know you just said i know how to find my way out of a minefield and when to seek shelter during a bombing raid. I know how to get through just about any checkpoint in the Middle East, the Balkans or Africa. Don't make eye contact. Have your papers ready, be polite but firm. Never, never get out of your car, especially if um, child soldiers wielding rocket propelled grenades are aiming them at your heart. I mean, yeah. this is not like the-, the I know. It's not a normal life. I know. It's not a normal life. And I and, know, and, I know. And often, you know, yeah. really, to me, it's very, it's what I've done for so long that it, um, I often forget that ordinary people are so like, I'm reading that and I'm like, that sounds like a, a, a war Hollywood movie. And, like you, and you're the hero. Like Angelina Jolie is about to jump in and, you know what I mean? That's your life. You're, you're, Except oh, that if, if Angelina Jolie, they, I think she did make a film about, um, called Beyond Borders, which is actually, yes. awesome. but everything in it then is, you know, her shirt is perfectly white and everything's groomed and, and you know, real no, life and war is not, war is um, messy and actually messy yeah. and boring. You know, there's either moments of intense, intense uh, fear and action or long periods of waiting for something to happen. So, um, Janine, anyway, 
why did you uh, it's fascinating to me because you are well, a highly educated person you you were born in america right in the u.s um half italian half i guess american i don't know and and beautiful and and what made you choose this path this career of danger how did you become a, a war correspondent that's fascinating for me well i i didn't choose it it, it chose me and that's really the best explanation I can give. I really, in a million years, it didn't, it's not what I wanted. It's not what I set out to do. I never wanted to be a journalist. Um, I wanted to be a writer my whole life. And I was actually studying to be an academic because I thought I'd have a really nice life as an academic working at a university and I'd be able to write my books and I'd be in a community of like-minded people. Wow. But then one day um, I was studying in London and I picked up a newspaper and it was a picture of an Israeli soldier burying a Palestinian teenager alive um, with a dump truck full of sand. And they were laughing and jeering. And I, you know, I paid no attention to the news or newspapers. I really lived in a world of, of books, um, of, of fiction mm -hmm. and um, Russian fiction. And I, um, I, I read the article and it was about the first intifada. And the article was actually about a lawyer, a human rights lawyer who was called Felicia Langer. And she was a Jewish Holocaust survivor who had gone to Israel in 1948 and became a lawyer and defended Palestinians in military court. And she basically at that time was the was the was one of the only Jewish lawyers doing that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to make a long story short, I met her and she changed my life forever because I, she opened my eyes to something. Um, before that, I had never been to a refugee camp. I had no idea that people lived with that kind of oppression and, and pain. And she said to me, if you have the ability to go to these places and write about it, then you have an obligation. And that was it. I was in my 20s and I, um, my life changed forever. Educational career then, yeah. Yeah, and you may- um, yeah. And uh, on the topic of journalism, then we have a couple of audience questions from you because we're getting up to that uh, um, three quarters of the way through. Um, there are conflict journalists who sadly, no matter how careful they were, died in the line of duty. Uh, many entities that um, <clears throat> document journalism say it's one of the most uh, dangerous professions on the planet. Um, I'm thinking of my friend Marie Colvin who died in Syria in 2012 while reporting on the siege of Homs. And in fact, she may have actually been targeted by the regime. Is the death of Marie and others something that weighs heavily on your mind, especially when you are in these zones of conflict? Well, Marie was also a good friend of mine and mm -hmm. we worked together at the Sunday Times from. Wow. You know, my first job was at the Sunday Times um, and Kurt Shork, who was, you know, one of the most courageous war reporters who was killed when we were working together in Sierra Leone. Um, Steve Sutloff and Jim Foley, who were both um, friends. Steve Sutloff was a, a dear friend. They were both executed by by ISIS. Um, many of my friends who were killed in Sarajevo, in Africa, in in Syria and throughout the Middle East, um, the list could go on. And then we're not, that's that's the people who were killed yeah. in combat. Then let's even begin to talk about the people that killed themselves or drank themselves yeah. to death or suffered immensely from the things they saw. Um, I think I think your question is, is it worth it? Um, and I, you know, I think the issue of Marie is very complicated because there are yes. other demons driving her, um, yes. but, I think that all of the people we talked about had a very clear mission, which was to bear witness to something and um, to record it, to document it. Yes, it is the most, probably the most dangerous job on the planet, aside from being a, a emergency room doctor right now yeah. um, or a soldier. And actually it's more dangerous than being a soldier because I've been in many studies with a Canadian psychiatrist called Dr. Anthony Feinstein, who is at University of Toronto, extraordinary mm. man. He did the first study on post-traumatic stress disorder and its effect on war reporters back in 2000. And I was part of his study group. Now he's doing the same thing about moral injury. 
And basically he says to me, you and your tribe always think you're invincible. Yes. And you it's probably the most dangerous job on earth because a soldier will do maybe one or two, possibly three tours of duty, right? right? The average war reporter does it for between 16 and 20 years. Wow. So the chances of getting, in my case, it's 30, right? Um, I've taken a few years out to, my son is in high school in New York. And, and so I don't, well, well, I did this, I still travel to places, but not with the kind of intensity of living in places the way I used to. But once he goes to college, I will start again. Mm -hmm. If you haven't been injured or killed in 30 years, that's pretty good odds, right? <laughs> Considering that, um, you know, some of the places I've been where cities have fallen, cities under siege, active aerial bombardment. Um, so I think every person who does this job, it, it's a very noble profession. You know, it really um, is something you don't get paid very well. You don't mm -hmm. get treated very well. Um, in my time, it was very sexist. Um, you know, I think male editors now don't get away with what they got away in the time yeah. when Marie and I were yeah. um, young. Um, so it's not an easy job. And it's interesting when sometimes I get young women who say, I want to be a war reporter. It's so cool. And I just think, mm -hmm. boy, it is anything but cool. Um, cool, it is not. Um, but it is find, uh, entirely did, satisfying. Sorry? Sorry, but you did find love. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, I've been digging on you. And yeah. I, I was fascinated. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. You did. And there was a book, actually, uh, one of, well, not this one, but The Ghost by Light in the War of Born Love. And I read uh, an article about you, and uh, that was so inspiring because, I, you know, my background is acting. Um, you know, I've been doing it in Hollywood, and I'm like, there has to be somebody who has to pick up your story and make a movie out of it because well, I'd love it if you could do it. That would be it's a beautiful love story. <laughs> oh, okay, well, hey, I might just do because yeah, I love, love that. Uh, oh um, my god, I was like, you know, this story has to be told. This is I like know, um, it's a beautiful love story, and there's beautiful a beautiful child story. because of that. But it's a tragedy too because it's like I mean I could not believe it. I was like, wow, it's 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 not quite a Hollywood ending because you survived the wars, you survived violence, you. You were in different places. He's a war correspondent like yourself, French, right? Mm. And you were meeting in different places. So lots of adventures and romance. But at the same time, when all that stopped, you dealt with another war, yeah. which was um, alcoholism, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and, and this subject is interesting because addiction, you know, like how, how do you actually cope with these kind of jobs? People drink. I mean, you would think it's a normal thing, right? But how do you stop once you stop? Well, part of Well, part of Anthony Feinstein's study was that um, the level of, um, amongst the war correspondents who did have post-traumatic stress disorder, I didn't, I was one of the few who didn't, was the highest level of alcoholism, drug use, promiscuity, divorce. Um, very, very, very difficult for people to keep a stable life and at one point I mean and the thing you know someone people always ask me would you advise this especially for young women and I say absolutely you know we need people we need to pass the baton mm -hmm. to the next generation we need to train human rights activists and people who could document atrocities but for women if you want to have a child, not everyone does. And, and I would in no way judge anyone. I think it's a, a terrible thing society kind of puts on women that you have to be a mother and you have to be a wife because that's Absolutely. it's not for everyone. No. Um, I didn't become a mother till very, very late in life. I wasn't ready, nor did I want, want to have a child. I really didn't until the moment was right for me. And I think that it this job makes it very difficult because you have to... Um, somehow find a balance. And that's a very personal balance. What Clarissa Ward does, she has two children, how she manages it is very different from how I managed it. Um, but it is possible. I have a wonderful 17 year old son who's setting off to go to Yale in September um, and he, who is a future Middle East peacemaker. Um, so I know we did something right, his dad and I, um, but it is not an easy life by any means. And it's not, um, something, it's not for everyone either. I mean, I remember very early on in, in Sarajevo, 
being with a, um, a reporter for TV news and he, it was a, a, the very terrifying time during the siege of Sarajevo on Sniper's Alley. And he just said, he came in one day and he just said, this is not for me. And I think it takes tremendous courage to do that. And he left, you know, and it was no, it was just, I thought that was far more courageous mm -hmm. than people who stuck around and were scared to death, but hid it and were unable to say, I'm really scared. If you're not scared, there's something wrong with you. Yeah. I was going to say, you're very generous in sharing your feelings in the book. And you did say you were scared many times, many times. Yeah, you know, of course. Like running under the bullets and execution, yeah. kidnapping, um, threats. So I don't know, for me, like you are the modern time Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> you are the real Wonder Woman. So, um, yeah, no, it's extraordinary. I'm, um, I'm a fan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, as all women, we, we, it's a very difficult time in society and we're all just doing our best to get through this, right? Like whatever it takes, whether it's, you know, whatever we find. And in my case, I'm very grateful. I have faith in God. I'm grateful that when I go for a walk, I can, you know, I live in downtown Manhattan and, you know, I pass this very beautiful Italian church. And um, if it's open, I go in, I light a candle um, there's also a Ukrainian Orthodox church not far from me in the East I know Village. It. Yeah. I live very close to little Ukraine. And, um, but I could go there and, and, and I just feel like I am lucky to have that. And I do have friends mm -hmm. who say to me, I would give anything to believe that. Um, I'm not there to convert them, by the way. I said that earlier, but, but yeah. I just feel grateful I have my own. Yeah. So... Speaking of Ukrainian, uh, we do have a question for you. Um, this is from uh, Bishop Ken Novakovsky in London. He's the Bishop of Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Slovak Eastern Catholics in Great Britain. In November, 2014, Pope Francis and the Orthodox Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew I issued a rare joint statement against anti-Christian violence in the Middle East saying, that the world cannot stand by and allow a Middle East without Christians. It is almost a decade since that joint statement was released, and yet we still see a great exodus of Christians from the Middle East. What can or what should the international community be doing to curb the reasons for this great exodus? Well, Absolutely. I mean, the thing is that what we don't want is a homogenized Middle East, right? We, these, all of these um, minorities are hugely important. Iraq. Iraq had a thriving Jewish community until the 50s when they, the first wave of them um, driven out, killed, um, the community disappeared. The, Bag the Jewish community of Baghdad was vibrant, hugely important, um, and they're gone. So, I mean, that is what could happen to the Christians in Iraq. And if that happens, Iraq is not Iraq without the mosaic of these people who contribute so much to the society and, and the life. Um, so absolutely, there are policies that could be put in place to protect these people. Um, whether it's, okay, so radicalization. And again, each, each country is different. So there's radicalization, extremism, for instance, in Iraq, the Christians fear the most Iranian-backed militias or HTS, you know, the radical groups in Syria or the Turkish military strikes, airstrikes. But equally, climate change. Climate change is a big issue in the Middle East. The Middle East is heating up faster. I think it's twice the rate of, of anywhere else. And this summer, there were temperatures rising into 120 degrees. Um, rivers are dry, drying up. So in Iraq, the great rivers, the Euphrates, the Tigris, the Nile in Egypt, where people have livelihood, this is all threatened. So again, policies towards climate change. Gaza, I think we need to reactivate immediately peace talks. Um, it, it, they, in, Trump, of course, did great damage to um, the Middle East, uh, Israel, Palestine, his awful son-in-law, um, you know, the Abraham Accords, which basically left the Palestinians out of any kind of um, yep. um, deal, which, which they were trying to do, the deal of the century. 
Um, I think we need to get peace talk started again. I think we need to recognize that Christians in the Middle East are a minority that are extremely vulnerable and need to be protected. And finally, I think that um, that each and every congregation, whether it's Ukrainian, Slovak, uh, Presbyterian, needs to reach out to communities, individual communities in the Middle East and assist, assist them because they are, they're, they're brothers and sisters. Um, mm -hmm. And they are in need and they need to know that they are not alone. They're not fighting this alone, that we are aware of it. We are, we've got their backs. So absolutely there are policies that can be used to protect them. Okay, thank you for that. And yes, uh, we have a second question from Yafa Frederick from CNN Opinion New York City. And she said, um, Janine's reporting on this issue is both fascinating and alarming. Um, is there any, anything that could happen, be done to reverse this exodus trend? Or are we heading towards um, a religiously hom homogenous Middle East in our lifetime? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, look, the numbers, um, the reason it's being called an exodus is that the numbers are just drastic. Um, and it's very difficult because censuses weren't taken in, in Iraq, for instance, the last one was 40 years ago in the time of Saddam. And we don't know now exactly precisely how many Christians are left, but it was, it was 1.5 million, we believe. Now it's something like anywhere between 100,000 and 300,000, and I'd say closer to 100,000. Um, social scientists say that by, in a century, there will not be Christians in Iraq, Syria, the Levant. But I was on a call um, with the Archbishop of Canterbury's people in London, and I was interrupted by a bishop from Lebanon who said, 100 years? Are you kidding? It's 40 years wow. at most. So I think this is really urgent. Um, I don't think it's something we could sit on the way we sat on climate change for 40 years. You know, 40 years ago, we could have reversed things. Mm -hmm. We didn't. I think we can reverse this, but we need to make incentives for them to stay there, um, which means job training, jobs for youth, um, outsourcing. I mean, why is all the outsourcing in the Philippines and India? Gaza are some of the best linguists in the world. Why can't we have outsourcing there? When you call your bank, you know, you get someone in Manila. Why can't you get someone in Gaza sure. or in Mosul or in Kirkuk? Um, or in uh, Damascus, you know? I mean, I just think that we need to think of more innovative ways to educate people, to keep them there, to keep them working so they stay in the land that they have lived in for 2000 years. We can't let them leave. If they leave, we will lose this unbelievable history that they have in, in that part of the world. It's their ancestral land. Well, <laughs> what an answer. And I, I think that's a great way to, uh, we could talk for hours to you. I know, it's been fun. Close. Um, and um, yeah, I, what you just said is so true. I remember when I was in Gaza and many other places uh, and the mothers especially would tell me, <clears throat> education is really the only weapon we have. And that's why we send our school, to our kids to school because this is what will get them through this you yeah. know, painful period of ours. Anyway, again, the book is The Vanishing, Faith, Loss, and Twilight of Christianity in the Land of Prophets. Janine Dujanoani, thank you so much. Please stay safe, and we salute your reporting and your bravery. It's such an honor to have you and talk and to you. Thank you so much for being patient with me getting ready for the camera. <laughs> Not you at know all. What? I mean, you've done amazing. <laughs> this lady got ready in five minutes. Oh yeah, no, that's from yes. wartime. I could, I could, just so you know, people. I'm just five saying. minutes. I could, I could dress, and I'm ready in five minutes. Happy yeah. New Year! Lovely to see you, and thank you for being patient organizing this too. I know I had to cancel a few times, but not at all. Really yeah. grateful to you, and and send me the links so we could tweet it and everything. Absolutely, yeah. we will. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.
All right. Well, it was lovely to have uh, Gianni Di Giovanni on the, on the show. I mean, she's truly remarkable and so inspiring and her faith, her strength, everything. And definitely there should be a movie about her life and I'll be working on it. But uh, thank you, Michael, for, um, you know, uh, setting up all this and um, inviting her on the show. And we want also to thank Pretty, our assistant producer back in the UK, who's always on call with us, yes, no matter the yes. time. She's amazing. She's doing an amazing job. And, um, and also, we have a, a lineup of amazing guests, and we're going to keep them as a surprise. Mm -hmm. So we will tell you on time, but yeah, it's going to be a very, very exciting year. And I'm going to leave you on that note that please subscribe, share, and like, because what we want to do is keep going and connect the dots. So, so you don't we... have to. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> and um, all right. Do you want to say your... Yeah, um... thank you, uh, Melissa. Uh, this was a great conversation. Uh, again, thank you to Janine. Um, I've been on panels with her before, and she never fails to disappoint in terms of what's on her mind. It's always unfiltered, but very, very eloquently said. And yes, again, please don't forget to share, like, tell everybody, absolutely everybody about Global Impact. That's it from us in Los Angeles and here in Sydney, British Columbia. Until we meet again, thank you and goodbye. New Year 2022, goodbye. Bye.